From Tokyo, my dear, dear friends, this is Daisuke, and I am today very, very happy because we are joined by a really wonderful guest, a friend of ours, and a friend of the community, and also a wonderful film enthusiast. And I am looking at the the Zoom screenshot as I speak, and I'm I'm wondering. Oh, does our guest like John Carpenter or not? Let me ask. But yeah. uh, hopefully that and other things will be on the menu for uh, discussion today. I'm really looking forward to it immensely. It is our dear friend, Mr. Ryan Chataway. Ryan, hello. Hello, Daisuke. Thanks for having me on. Before I begin, uh, you know, do you like John Carpenter? He's all right. Like, uh I mean, I I just I just heard of him like a couple of weeks ago. I was like, oh, he he does these seasonal shirts. Okay, so this one's Halloween. Maybe he has a Christmas one. Uh, okay, that's I'm joking aside. I love John Carpenter. Um, maybe not to the extent that our friend Luke does, doing a whole series dedicated to John Carpenter. But um, every John Carpenter movie I've seen, I love. So, and of course, Halloween's one of my all-time favorite movies. So. Saw this shirt, had to get it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very jealous. I wish I had, I wish I had my own Halloween shirt, but uh, it's great. It's it's very cool. And uh, yes, so uh, Ryan, thank you so much for taking uh, the time out of your busy schedule to do this. I really appreciate it, my friend. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, I'm very, I'm excited too. I've been looking forward to this for a while and I've enjoyed this series so far with you interviewing thank people. You introduced me to a lot of people that I now watch. Um, can't name them all off the top of my head, but they're in my subscription feed and I watch them from time to time. So um, yeah, I'm definitely flattered and happy that you asked me to join you this time. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, and I, I think you mentioned YouTube and you mentioned subscriptions. And uh, before we uh, get into any further topics, I suppose uh, the best place to begin is just uh, for people who might be meeting you today for the first time, Ryan, uh, could you uh, uh, introduce yourself a little bit and maybe talk also about uh, your own uh, YouTube channel and where people might find you? So could you just uh, introduce yourself a little bit for those of us who are meeting you for the first time? Okay, so um, channel name is Ryan Chataway, and I started it back in 2011. Gosh, it's so crazy how long it's been, but, uh, it really just started out because I saw people making videos about movies and their love of movies. And I was like, I want to join in that conversation. So really for the past 10 years, um, I've just been uploading videos and just sharing my love of movies with everybody. And, um, kind of mix that with vlogging because I've always been the type where I like having a camera in front of my face just to talk about random stuff. I used to be that kid that vlogged all his vacations and stuff as a little kid. I always wanted to be a filmmaker. So I just like being in front of the camera. So you have videos of me talking about movies, uh, going to places, uh, but mainly movies is my focus on my channel. And one of the things I've loved doing is doing like community type stuff. And so I created a 24 hour movie marathon challenge in 2012 and, and every year we do it. And it is still happening again this year, the 10th year that we've been doing it, which is crazy as well. Um, but yeah, basically I just talk about movies that I love and I try not to upload videos about stuff I don't like, because I've always been the type of person where if I'm going to spread love of something, I don't want to, upload a video ranting about why I don't like this movie or that movie. I'd rather just talk about what I love. And that's kind of what I've stood by from the very beginning. And so, yeah, you could find me on YouTube and all that fun stuff. And um, I'm just glad I did. I met, met a lot of cool people over the years and 
I can't imagine my life, especially like through my twenties and stuff without it, uh, because of the community and growing in terms of other films that I wanted to watch and people getting me into this and to that. And so it's just been a great time. So yeah, that's me in, on YouTube and my channel name is my name, Ryan Shadowway. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much, Ryan. And yes, and uh, you had mentioned, uh, as an example, you had mentioned the uh, the twenty four hour movie marathon that uh, that that format and that kind of project, uh, which is uh, every time I think about it, it's it's very it's mind boggling to me, uh, and so I'm I'm always very impressed with that. Could you explain a little bit about what that is? and what the what what the concept is and and how you go about approaching that particular concept or project the 24-hour movie marathon yeah so i started it back in 2012 because um there was a lot of stuff on youtube there's like a huge um um riff and split in different communities whether it's the horror community there, you know and when you do videos and you get involved with film communities there's a lot of these little like splits that happen from time to time and back then it was a huge thing and youtube used to be really big on video responses so you'd be able to make videos and upload them as responses to other people's videos in their comments they a few years after i joined did away with that um but i just thought it'd be cool like to do a community kind of event where I set guidelines up and, you know, it really just started out of, it'd be really cool to watch 24 hours worth of movies, like a challenge. Cause we all love watching movies and we've all binge watched movies over the course of a night. And I was like, what if I turned that into a challenge? And so I picked 24 hours and uh, the main purpose was to vlog about what you were doing. What were you doing to stay awake? what you were eating, what you were drinking, um, and then reviewed the movies. And obviously, um, you know, the guidelines, I usually have like five to eight, depending on what year it was. And it's like watch a movie over 180 minutes. And a lot of that kind of stuff was geared towards getting people to participate in the marathon and maybe get introduced to silent movies or, um, you know, Japanese cinema, that kind of stuff. And like, um, it really worked. I mean, I know of people that did the marathon that had never seen a silent movie who ended up doing the requirement and they saw a silent movie. Next thing you know, um, they pretty much bought every single silent movie you could think of that's available on home video and they got really hardcore into it. Um, I, this person hasn't had a YouTube channel in years, but I just remember. And, um, it's been really, it's been really cool. Like just seeing people get into other kinds of movies based on a, on a requirement. Um, I also one year did, cause I know a lot of people say like, Oh, I, I don't like musicals. I'm not into musicals. So one year I made musicals, one of the guidelines. And it was funny hearing some people say, you know, I'm not really a big musicals person, but I picked this movie and it was great. And so that was kind of where it all branched out. And then it, um, it turned into, and then Luke, Luke did it, and he's Luke Razor Hour Reviews, um, a good buddy of mine, close friend. Um, he participated in the first one. He's done every one of them, and the second year is when he started incorporating little skits and having me guest appear in his videos and stuff, and it kind of blew up into this huge, uh, I mean, my videos are over a, a few hours long, and they're heavily edited and stuff. But Luke's have ballooned to like nine hours, I think, at one point. And the production has been crazy big on these videos. And that's where it all started, just watching movies and having fun doing it. And we could kind of, from, I guess, from what Luke says over the years, we could just kind of stroke our egos a little bit with having fun with the cameras and writing these little skits to be involved, kind of make it more fun. And uh, that's kind of where it where it started. I did not think it was going to last over a couple of years, but it's kind of been one of those things where I can't imagine not doing it. I've even said that I'll, even if YouTube ever goes away, there's always going to be a way to do the marathon. And I've joked around. I mean, this is kind of my morbid sense of humor, but I always said that like my gravestone is going to have 
whatever the rules are for the year that I die, that's what everybody's going to have. Like, that's how um, serious it is. And I just, I love it. I'm glad, I'm glad that I, I came up with it because I was going through a period of time where I was kind of thinking of ideas, but then not really following through with them. But this is one that I was like really glad I latched onto and I did it. So that is the origins and why I do it. <laughs> That is, uh, thank you so much for that. That that's that's fascinating, and it, so you know, I've I've uh, I am I don't know, like it's it's uh, fascinating to me about watching however many films it ends up being over say mm -hmm. a, a certain prescribed period of time, and I can imagine that takes a lot of of energy and effort and a lot of enthusiasm. And it's it's interesting, like like, uh, and also for me. Um, well, let let me ask you. So so the concept also involves watching films. Let's say maybe essentially one after the other after the other. Or how how does that work in terms of spacing out uh, your watches in between? So the original plan, the original idea that I had, and I did it for many years, was watching this amount of movies in a 24 hour period without sleeping. Usually with all the guidelines and stuff, um, it always ended up being like 24 hours worth of movies, but I would do one after the other, after the other. And in fact, to the point to where, I mean, it got to the point a few years into it where I was just like physically ill. At the fact that I was still awake, um, like been, and I would always do it after a long work day. So like, I was already up 12 hours before I started the 24 hour movie marathon. So the beginning of those videos, I'm like, all right, everybody, it's marathon time. It's going to be awesome. And then halfway through the video, um, like I'm like laying on my couch, my hair is all crazy all over the place. So I'm like half asleep, like, Oh my gosh. Uh, and I'm like exhausted. And, uh, I, so that was, that's the, that was the whole purpose behind it was just staring, staying awake, watching movies for 24 hours. And then um, I realized that not a lot of people could do 24 hour sittings and watch movies, whether it's because of jobs and all that kind of stuff. And I really wanted more people involved. So um, Luke kind of coined the whole way of doing it of 24 hours worth of movies over a period of like two or three days, which um, is equally, if not more exhausting because you're dedicating more days to watch movies than you had planned initially. And, uh, yeah, he always tells me that when he does it, he's, he's so exhausted by the end of it. And even though he sleeps and then wakes up and starts again, it's still just mentally exhausting, especially the way, I mean, the way me and you and Luke like-minded people like us like we watch movies for more than just the entertainment we look at it from our perspectives and we look deeper into movies and um it's not just sitting there watching the movies it's if we're going to film a video about it we're going to dissect it and doing it after 24 hours is exhausting so like the beginning movies i would review they were like 10 minute reviews and then meanwhile by the end of it i'm so exhausted that i'm like yeah i just watched so and so it was awesome more about it in a future video um so really it's just 24 hours worth of movies or staying awake for 24 hours and watching movies it kind of go either way it's more about the fun of the event and the guidelines um but yeah that's that's kind of how it goes and that's really great that's really great, and you're you're showing your enthusiasm and, and your love for the uh, the 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 cinema and watching it, and it, it becomes its own event, which is which is wonderful. And you're devoting your like you, your physical uh, the the physical energy uh, that is required and the stamina that's required. You know, that's also an indication of the passion that drives uh, you and, and the other participants. So that's really wonderful. Yeah, I have uh, another fun, funny thing I kind of yeah. want to mention too. One thing that I like to do is anybody who's like seen my videos over the years, I have a thing where it's like, 
I don't just pick movies that are like um, maybe easier movies to watch where you can get through the um, get through the time period easier without. But I always end up doing crazy stuff like my first year, the first movie I watched was um, pretty sure it was the first movie I watched. I watched Titanic. And then immediately after Titanic, I watched the uncut German miniseries version of Da's Boat. <laughs> and so I kept doing these long, long movies and it was just draining me even more, but I loved the movies. And then a couple years after that, that I did uh, Bernardo Bertolucci's 1900, which is a movie I really, I, I love as well. And so I'm like, I just throw in these like five, six hour epics and by the time I'm done with those, I'm already exhausted. But that's kind of my thing. I always try to, um, I actually said one of these years, I'm just going to do, I'm going to like watch something like, um, I have Shoah sitting over there. And I still, still haven't finished it because it's such a hard movie to watch. But uh, I was like, man, I should probably do like an even longer movie, maybe something like Shoah or something, which I don't think I'm going to be able to do because that'll just completely mentally and physically just destroy me. But um yeah i just wanted to throw that in there because that's something that i always add to the craziness as well <laughs> mm. oh oh thank you very much for that and i so it's it really i guess it can be tailored to one's own uh say cinema journey and so you have a choice as to what you want to watch and uh, you, based on, as you say, your your uh, your own uh, tastes in cinema. So uh, that's great. And speaking of your tastes in cinema, my friend, I, I have to now ask you, uh, which is, uh, you know, you are now a very active film enthusiast and you have this uh, you have an online presence uh that you say is now uh for example your youtube channel is what it's it's uh you it's over what's it it's 10 years uh 10 years you've been at youtube correct mm -hmm. 10 that years. is wow well, well done well done <laughs> so uh 10 years and so that is uh, yet another example of your love for cinema and so, but of course, with, with a lot of things, it had to have its beginnings, right? It had to start somewhere. And so uh, I want to now ask you, Ryan, the, for you, where were those beginnings? What were those uh, films that you remember growing up with and the milestone cinema moments for you uh, growing up that led you to be the this film enthusiast that you are today? So... I, um, luckily I have a mom who is a hardcore, um, cinephile. Um, I personally, I mean, I'm one to say that my mom is one who, me and my mom have share the, our, the favorite film that we, we, the Godfather part one and two, which I always kind of consider one movie. They're both me and my mom's favorite movies of all time. And so we have a lot of the similar, so I grew up with that. And um, so growing up, you know, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and going out to the living room. My parents would be watching Casablanca, um, just different stuff on, um, you, you may remember this when AM, back when AMC, before they did shows like The Walking Dead, it, AMC was like another Turner classic movies. Um, so we always watched movies as a family growing up and I was always into it. I was obsessed with um, Batman, like Michael Keaton's Batman as a kid. And it was, I was just, I think I wore out like three different VHSs of it and I was just obsessed. And so over the years, I just loved movies, but it really took off when my parents got divorced when I was like eight and my mom moved to an apartment that was on the other side of town and we would go visit her on the weekends. And this was during, it was a terrible year personally, but um, I've always kind of said movies kind of kept me during that time. And I remember being in her apartment complex and in the main office, they had a little VHS library that you could go into. And if you live there, you could just sign a little paper and you could just rent whatever you want. And I was a big history nerd when I was younger and I still am, um, you know, we call our house the library. We have all my movies and 
we have books all over the place and shelves everywhere. So like I'm a big history nut and I came across the VHS cover of the movie, um, A Bridge Too Far, Richard Attenborough's World War II epic. And I loved the front cover. The front cover at that time, it was like, you see like the Spitfire or the, the, the bomber jet flying by the bridge and it looked really cool. And remind me of those World War II books that I always loved reading as a kid. And so I got it, took it home, um, watched it, loved it. I think I watched it twice over like two days as a kid watching a good war movie. And then I was like, I want to see more of these. And so I lived two blocks from a blockbuster. So that led to me every week, I was going to get a new war movie, a new classic. And within a couple of years, I had pretty much um, racked up hours of viewing tons of movies. And then when I was 10, I rented, no, I didn't rent it. It was on TV. It was the 1997 edition of AFI's 100 Years, 100 Movies that, that was on TV. And I watched it. And as a nine and 10 year old, I told myself, I'm going to see every movie on that list within the next couple of years. So by the time I was 12, I had seen all those movies and I loved all those movies. And so I kind of just, not to mention all the horror movies I was into. I mean, my mom, when she was pregnant with me, she was, um, her tradition with all of her, her kids, I'm the youngest of four, was going, when she was pregnant, going to watch horror movies. So she said when she was pregnant with me and my oldest brother and my sister, she had watched all the Friday the 13th movies in the theaters and stuff like that. So I like, I like to say that's why I like Friday the 13th as well, because I was kind of born with it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just, my movie loving really started when I was a kid and it just kind of, um, kept me going as a kid when I was kind of down because my parents getting divorced and that kind of thing. And I just fell in love with it and it's never, never left me since. So yeah, that's, that's where the origins of my cinematic experience lies <laughs> during that whole time period. Oh, that's really that's really great. And to pick up on something that you mentioned. So as you said, you, your mother really liked horror movies and that's where maybe you got that, that the horror movie love from as well. What were some of those films in that genre that you uh, remember watching as well? So I was still never, you know, my mom had a strict rule to where she did not want me to watch movies that I could not watch, you know, um, she did at a very young age, I did see Schindler's List, but it was her, it was me watching it when it was shown on NBC back in the nineties, when it was that huge event and it was going to be on TV um, with no commercials, none of that intro by Steven Spielberg. And, um, but I watched it, but she was sitting right there with me the whole time. So whenever sequences of violence happened, she was teaching me the context of everything as it was happening to where, you know, as a kid, I'm learning about these things. So she wouldn't let me see. I actually didn't find out about the horror movie thing until like I got a little bit older. Um, my love of horror movies kind of started at a friend that lived near me. And uh, I went spend a night at his house one night. And he was, he was a huge movie, like a huge horror movie guy. And he had um, the blockbuster exclusive. Ed I still remember it. And in fact, I bought it on eBay like one time the exclusive blockbuster edition of Halloween. And then he had Day of the Dead and Dawn of the Dead, the the original um, Romero films. And around that same time, I was mowing yards for somebody who had movies and I borrowed their Night of the Living Dead. And this was all around the time I was like eight or nine watching all these movies. I was way too young to see them. But those are the first horror movies that I started watching. And then... Halloween turned into Friday the 13th and Friday the 13th turned into, um, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street and the list just continued to go on. And I started getting into at that time, which was more obscure stuff like, um, I mean, in the internet, internet age, um, George Romero was a household name, but growing up, I was like, I feel like I was the only kid who knew the name George Romero. And it's not like you could, I mean, everybody kind of knew there was a movie called Night of the Living Dead, but not every kid at school would have ever heard of Dawn of the Dead or Day of the Dead. Um, 
you know, everybody kind of knew the main guys like Halloween and stuff like that. But um, so that those are the movies that I kind of started on very early. So that was all around the same time, which is crazy. It just shows how much I was like really immersed into escaping from the personal stresses at the time. Like I was just like, like full blown. And in fact, I ended up know, knowing all the workers at Blockbuster all the time. They gave me free rentals all the time because I was always up there and uh, drop my mic. Um, I pretty much lived up there at one point. Not really, but I was up there all, it was my home away from home. So. Yeah, I, I too remember going to Blockbuster Video and going in and I think they more or less had the same or similar layout uh, depending, of course, on the location, of course, but there were many locations mm-hmm. back in the day. But you go in, and they'd have those like like security alarm things at the the entrance yep. and the exit. I'd always be nervous uh, whenever mm-hmm. I'd leave. You know, the, you'd go to the register, you give them the box, and they they'd give it to you after you cleared the security, right? Yep. You know, and I'd always maybe oh gosh, if 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 it goes off, you know, my keys. Or, I don't know. I, I was always nervous. I'm always nervous when I when I go through things like that and, and the blockbuster every time I felt that way. And cause it looked like, I mean, it was like an airport security. <laughs> yes, like that's yes. what's crazy. Like it yeah. was, you really, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you'd walk through like this, like, Oh man. And then, I mean, if it even went off, like we were scared that it would go off, but like, <laughs> what would they do? Like, like I felt like I was getting like shot if I like, if yeah. it rang, I'm like, Oh my gosh, they're not going to let me see this movie now. Yeah. yeah those were the days and you'd go yeah. in and it would be, the the new releases i think alphabetically organized mm-hmm. and then you go and then you'd walk around and you go back to whatever it is the end of the alphabet and then in the middle of the floor area would be the 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 drama section the horse what it, the horse section, the kids section yep and they'd have those low shelves so you'd you'd walk in the aisles but you could still look over right so it yep. would be maybe about it would be i mean if i was a kid so i wasn't that tall but still, you could sort of make out where everything was overall, and, and it had that that uh, uh, what was that that jingle? What a difference! Blockbuster video, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So those were the days, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I remember very vividly. Like you know, be, I'd be I spent so long looking at movies and reading the backs, and then all of a sudden, like in the back, you'd hear, um, you know, Bruce Willis is back and Die Hard with a Vengeance. And then I'd turn around and catch the little clip on the TV and then pick up the next movie to start looking again. It was like, I don't know, I'd just get nostalgic. I mean, obviously, during the time, I was like, man, I have to rewind this or I have to pay my parents. I mean, I'm so thankful for them, but the amount of late fees that they probably had to pay and the amount of money they probably spent on late fees, like, oh, those were some high late fees was there a fee was there a fee charge for not rewinding i I forget um Uh, at my location i feel like they always kind of um (laughs) i didn't i don't think i ever got charged for a rewinding fee um i do know at my location they had like a little rewinder like one of those portable ones on the thing and so like I, i always return them to the desk and they would look at it and I remember a few times a guy would look at it and be like, you didn't rewind this and put it in the thing. And he'd be like, you got to do better next time. But he knew I was a kid and he, um, cause I, 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 my parents had the blockbuster card, but they had it on the account that where I could go in there with the card. I just ride my bike or skateboard up there. And it said, Ryan can rent this. And I think it was like, he could up until I was like nine or 10, it was like, Ryan could rent anything that's not rated R. Um, and so they kind of knew me and they didn't like really overcharge me for anything, but my dad would give me like five bucks and I'd rented so many times where on the receipt, it would say you earned one free rental. So I would go in there with like two receipts and I just, I'd leave with tons of movies. Um, and I devour them all the time. So. And that would be kind of an event. It would be, Mm -hmm whatever it was, Friday night, uh, what, let, let's go to the video store and, and get some movies or something like that to enjoy for the weekend. Uh, yeah, and it's funny because I think about it and I'm like, when did I have the time? Because I watched so many movies and I was always watching movies, but then I also 
I mean, I live in um, Jacksonville Beach, so like I grew up surfing and skateboarding. So like I and I had a lot of friends. So like I'm like, when did I ever have time to watch movies? But I think back and I'm like, all I did was watch movies. And it's just one of those things where I feel like I had more time back then. Oh, wait, it's because I wasn't working 80 or 40 plus hours a week. And, you know, before you became an adult. But uh, yeah, I just I, I love thinking back on those times and it's very nostalgic and thinking of the first times I saw certain movies and walking through Blockbuster and all that fun stuff. And you also said in uh, in your previous comments about how, what was it, you watched the the AFI uh, uh, top, uh, top movies or greatest movies of all time. Was that right? Yeah, so um, AFI does that whole, they've done it, they did like 10 best love movies or 10 best thrills and um in 1997 i think it was they did the abc special or on one of those primetime stations and it was 100 years 100 movies and so it was like a countdown of all the 100 um best best movies and i recorded it on v i knew it was coming on so i put in a tape and recorded it and i devoured that thing and i started going to blockbuster renting all the movies and uh um, yeah, I was just flying, flying through them. That was kind of my branching off, um, where I started getting into movies that were different than the ones I was really into because go from talking about, you know, just some fun war movies and Westerns and stuff. But then now you're on a list where we have, um, you know, Alfred Hitchcock and Stanley Kubrick and, um, I always kind of wish that it wasn't just American movies because I think I would have been introduced to like Kurosawa or Fellini like a lot earlier, but I went powered through all those films and um, it was like a completely, I was like, oh, this is what movies really can be. It's more than just having fun. It's an experience. And I had fun with that. I loved it. So you watched the films that were on that list uh, you said at a very young age, right? So that so that would have meant watching films like uh, Casablanca or the Godfather films, uh, Citizen Kane, uh, Hitchcock films. Is is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I remember the weekend that I mean, a lot of the and that's I've always been able to pinpoint like the first time I see a movie, I could just look at my collection over there. And, I kind of remember my experiences of each movie that I've seen the first time. And I remember one weekend, I think I was like 10, I rented Rear Window and Vertigo. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna knock these two movies off the list. Um, or maybe one of them wasn't on the list. Maybe Rear Window wasn't on the list that year, but I rented Vertigo, Rear Window, and I watched them all that Friday night. I was like blown away. So Vertigo and Rear Window were, were my first Hitchcock movies. Cause at that point I still hadn't seen Psycho which is crazy to me. I actually saw the remake of Psycho before I saw the original as a kid. Um, where was I going with that? Um, but I would watch these movies. I remember um, renting like The Searchers and renting Casablanca. One of the main ones that I remember watching was um, The Bridge on the River Kwai because it had um, Alec Guinness in it. And I remember as a kid going, oh my gosh, that's Obi-Wan from Star Wars. And he's a lot younger. And I was like, it's a war movie. I've never seen that. And so I rented it, loved it. That was like when I was like, became a, I was like, oh my goodness, is awesome. But I was like, but this guy, William Holden, he's the real deal. So then I started branching off into William Holden movies and seeing movies like Sunset Boulevard. And I'm still blown away that as a 10, 11 and 12 year old, I was watching these movies and like, falling in love with them and um because growing up in my house like you know how there's some people that are like well i'm not really into black and white movies like you know the whole i watch movies if they're color growing up all i saw with black and white movies was just a different way it looked i was like okay that movie's black and white like i never differentiated the fact that these movies are different i just was like oh the they just filmed it differently like um so I'm glad I didn't have any of that bias growing up. And then having my mom being into movies and me um, 
Like I never had an issue with watching a movie with subtitles. I'm a firm believer in watching movies in their native language with English subtitles. If I'm too tired to read, I'll probably put in a dub or something, but that's usually just for like a Miyazaki movie or something when, you know, Porco Rosso has Michael Keaton as the voice. So I'm like, well, it's cool to listen to Michael Keaton, you know, in this movie, but um, yeah, I don't know really where I was going with that, but yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, um, that's what happens when I start chatting away. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, and I, I, I should say also that I, I was in the States too at the time. I, for, I had forgotten what the year was when it was, I suppose, broadcast. But I too remember recording that, that first, whatever it was, greatest films show, uh, AFI. Um, I don't, I, I guess... I guess, is it a spoiler if I say the number one film at the time was Citizen Kane? Oh, man, I don't... Uh, well, <laughs> we should put a disclaimer at the beginning of this video, like saying, if you have not seen AFI's <laughs> 97 edition, don't yeah. watch this video. Yeah, and I think, actually, I, I still remember uh, you know, they had people who would comment, right? They'd interview little people yeah. or excerpts and why is this the greatest film or some, why mm -hmm. is this considered great? And I remember, I think for, uh, for Citizen Kane, they had a number of people included in which were, um, William Friedkin, right? Yes. The director, oh, it's the Mount Everest of yeah. or something like, and also Burt Reynolds. I think Burt Reynolds was talking about Citizen Kane and he was saying it, it was like the news because mm -hmm. it was news is black and white and and it was black and white and so uh and uh, oh yes yes i don't i don't think um uh yeah anyway sorry about that but i do remember that i too remember i watched that particular and they were and like kind of like piggybacking off what you said yeah like in seeing these and then like random actors like talking about them but like you said with yeah. like freakin and stuff like the special like all the quotes were like perfect it was like the mount everest and it was as a kid i was just like blown away by the editing and stuff like that too so yeah it was uh yeah so that that, that those sorts of shows or those sorts of lists i think are very valuable uh, as you indicated or as you suggested i think very uh very well in your recollection so i think uh, yeah so I, I i was there as well with uh, with those lists and i i don't think i don't think at the time i saw it i don't think i was i was able to have seen all of the films that were included but it was again a great resource uh, going forward and i i think then uh, just turning the conversation back i i guess to continue so what were then, how, how did your cinema journey progress? Uh, you had said that you, you were talking about uh, watching films in say original languages or subtitle, et cetera. So, but what were, and then you also mentioned earlier about how perhaps it would have been, uh, you know, that the AFI list was essentially uh, American movies. And I, I think mm -hmm. that was a very, it was an interesting concept and it, it right in terms of some of the films that were included as well and so but generally speaking that was the 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 criteria the criteria for for that particular list but from there what were then some of those films that that you began to explore say uh uh you know um outside of you know american films as it were uh you you began to talk about it a little bit but what were some of those examples of those first discoveries, so to speak. So there was a period of time um, I used to go to Blockbuster, I mean, obviously all the time, and I would always kind of skim by the foreign film section, which I think I was still in that phase of like, you know, thinking, um, you know, you know, that kind of cliche, um, I mean, I hate to say it, but heavily Americanized little kid saying, oh, a foreign film, that must be just some romantic kind of thing. That's just like kind of the perception that somebody who's not in the movies probably has. And I think I 
maybe had it, but I wasn't really ignorant about it. Like I just didn't really know. But I remember seeing um, just the covers of all these movies. And I remember being at the library. Um, and so this was probably like 2001. So I was a little bit older, um, maybe like 13, 14, 15, uh, yeah, 2001, like 13, 14 around there. And uh, I remember seeing movies like um, Seven Seal, Seven Samurai, uh, Gojira, which is really funny because I grew up watching the sci-fi channel when they would have the dubbed versions of, of Godzilla on there. So like one of my favorite movies as a kid was um, Godzilla versus Hedera. And cause I was like, man, Godzilla is fighting pollution. So like as a kid, that was one of my favorite movies. And so when I saw when I think Screen Media or whatever the company is that really re-released uh, Gojira for like the first time in like North America since like way back in the day, it was like the original Japanese masterpiece and I rented it and was blown away by it. And I was like, you mean I could actually find these original Japanese audio films? And for like Christmas that year, I asked my dad for everything that was Godzilla re Godzilla related they had just released that box set the same company that had like four or five of the films in it and um and then of course I would rent movies like like I said um Seven Samurai Seven Samurai was a big one because the library had a um it was like when Criterion DVDs like were really starting out um I mean, as you well know, like when Cry I didn't know anything about Criterion during the Laserdisc era. I didn't become uh, a Criterion fan probably until like the very early days of it. I feel like maybe it was like 2000, maybe even 1999. I can't remember. I remember it was like I went to a Barnes and Noble or something and it was like new releases and it was like spine number four. Like that's how like young I was when I started um looking at criterions but i remember renting the vhs of seven samurai and it was a very bad copy um and i started at like 10 o'clock at night and i finished the whole movie and was blown away by it and i was like i want to see every movie that this filmmaker did and that's when i started becoming not obsessed but thinking that tashira mifuni was like it's like one of the greatest actors that i wish more people in america talked about um so those are kind of the movies that I, and I guess um, Seven Seal I had known because of, wasn't really the biggest fans of the movies, but obviously the famous like Bill and Ted, like, um, you know, thing with death. And I know he, they modeled him after, you know, Seven Samurai is kind of like a spoof kind of thing. And um, I was never really the biggest fan of those movies. I like them, but I didn't grow up with the Bill and Ted movies, but I always had that vision of death. And I remember seeing the cover, the Criterion DVD cover of it, which I still have over there. Um, and it was just death standing there. And I was like, that image alone, like just gravitated me towards it. I was like, I'm going to rent that and I'm going to watch it. And it's going to be a fun time. And then I started watching it and I was like, this isn't fun, but it is incredible. <laughs> so that I, then, I, then it really became me wanting to rent from the library every single title that had the Criterion Collection on top. And so that's that's what it, what it became. And thankfully, I didn't have to worry about scratches or anything like that on the DVDs because people were there to rent um, popcorn kind of flicks. And so those were the movies that were all scratched. All the Criterions and stuff in the foreign film section were like always in pristine, collect, or pristine condition. So like that's kind of how I jumped off in terms of the foreign film market. Hmm. Oh, uh, thank you so much for that. So, so yes. So this was the, this was still the early days of the Criterion collection DVD releases. And I, and also, it, I mean, it was early days of also the, the, the format as well. Right. So yeah. you were there in the days where 
the, the, it was kind of a transition period in a manner of speaking and the introduction of the new format called DVD. Wow, what is this thing? It's so small. You can watch, mm -hmm. you can, it, it has the chapter skip. Wow, this is amazing. And uh, uh, when you pause it, when you pause it, there's not lines across the screen. Yeah. It's yeah. still, whoa. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And it was a really big deal. I mean, it mm -hmm. still is, of course, as a format in terms of the groundbreaking achievements and the compact size of it and the like. But I, I still remember that, that uh, watching those first uh, DVDs and uh, they'd have trailers or some, wow, this is, and not even, and not even letter, you know, the, the aspect ratio, that wasn't a given back in the day. Correct. And so, uh, and even with the, I think with blockbuster tapes, I think letterbox tapes were still somewhat uh, in the minority when it came to, I was, or not even minority in the very, very few uh, there were those letterbox tapes, but it wouldn't always be a guarantee that you'd get the letterbox format, right? Yeah, like if it was letterbox, it was like for, there was a reason for it. Whether it was like a, like a like letterbox, then it'd be like special edition version. It's like yeah. oh, so I was like ooh, I could actually see this um, this film. Like I remember like seeing Good, Bad, and the Ugly in letterbox for the first time, and I was blown away by how much I was seeing of the movie but then not blown away by the fact that it was like this much of my TV. But I had grown up with movies in widescreen enough to where like, it didn't bother me, but I was just like, man, I've been being robbed of seeing the entire picture all these years. <laughs> yeah, I remember having a similar reaction because when I watched, I watched that film and yes, I only known it in the maybe cropped version on Home media at the time and just remember being able to see it for the first time in this uh, in this aspect ratio in the widescreen uh, version that I was able to see whatever it was at the time VHS and it was it was it was incredible I, I didn't realize the extent to which the the use of the framing and the the distance versus the close-up shots especially in a lot of those a lot of those uh uh, dual shots, etc. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, that was incredible. Yeah, I um have a, I have a like a little funny kind of story about that. Is like one of my all time favorite movies now that I love. It was the movie I watched after I watched A Bridge Too Far, back in those days, and it was The Longest Day, which I still love to this day. And there's a scene at the beginning of the movie where, when they're introducing all the characters and there's a scene in the church and the priest is talking about deliverance is coming and there's a shot of a woman and then right behind her is a is a nazi and when the priest says deliverance is coming the camera's on her and the free and the the nazi and she kind of does this after the priest says that and looks back and then the the officer's behind her like this just sitting down but as a kid i actually thought they were multiple editions of that movie because in one um one release a very early vhs release it just had the woman um it was cropped the pain and scan was just her but then late later i saw a release that just had um the soldier and so i was like man so th did they film different aspects or different perspectives for this movie and so i remember when i saw it on dvd for the first time i was like it's the same shot Oh my God. I remember being blown away that the lady was actually sitting next to him and she was looking at him when she was turning around like that. And I just remember being blown away by that. And, um, and of course, learning about pan and scan, what that meant and all that kind of stuff. And how some studios would do different perspectives of the shot, depending on what they think the viewer needed to see. So yeah, I just wanted to throw that little nugget in there too. Oh, that's so I wonderful. Just, I just thought of that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes, it's, 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 uh, and of course, now, I mean, now, live, considering about the, the, the times that we live in now, and the availability of, uh, of all these films through whatever it is, streaming or physical media or the like, it's really remarkable to think back and to think what, what, what it was like back then.
it was still fun times, of course, but it was yeah. uh, it was a different world in a manner of speaking. That's for sure. Yeah. And uh, the and it was, but at the same time, you had these places, as you see, Blockbuster, and then Criterion was emerging, and then a new format was emerging, etc. And so that was further uh, adding to your your journey, so to speak. And so now, I, let me ask. Uh, you've mentioned a number of films already, uh, but could I uh, then uh, uh, press you a little bit and just uh, asking you, what are some of your now, uh, say, what would you say would be your favorite films or your favorite filmmakers that you uh, mention now whenever you're asked that question? Um, I always say, um, it kind of comes and goes a little bit, but my top like five, 10 have kind of included the same um the same amount of people based on my experiences with movies like Alfred Hitchcock, um, Martin Scorsese, Kurosawa, Coppola, um, now like Hayao Miyazaki, um, Fellini, all, I mean, really like all the greats, but, um, you know, on the top, like when it comes to directors, I feel like I have to own every one of their movies or something. It's always like, um, Billy Wilder or Martin Scorsese or even Spielberg and people like that. Um, I would, I wish I owned like more um, Bergman movies and I wish I owned more of um, just different, like even more like Kurosawa movies, but being um, like on Criterion don't always have the funds to get all of them all the time. But I own enough of them, the ones that I've seen that I love, and I have access to the other ones. So, uh, but yeah, I, I kind of have a bunch. Of, that's I'm one of those people that just has a bunch of different favorite filmmakers. And um, uh, but I guess if you would uh, twist my arm now, if I right now if I had to pick like a top three, it would probably be like um, Billy Wilder. Alfred Hitchcock and maybe like um, Martin Scorsese. Sometimes Kubrick gets back into there. Sometimes, um, you know, even sometimes like John Ford will get in there based on whatever movies um, that I love of his. But I kind of am just one of those people that just love it. I love a lot of people. And so it's hard to actually come up with a list. Um, I love David Lynch. Um, I'm just trying to look at some, but the one that I've been really big on the last year, year and a half is Billy Wilder. I've been trying to watch tons of Billy Wilder movies and I've added so many of them to my collection and uh, just a huge, huge fan of him. And so he's him and Hitchcock and Scorsese will probably be like always my top three. Oh, oh, very exciting. And could you also uh, let us know what are some of those films as well uh, from those filmmakers or from others uh, that you uh, really cherish at the moment? Yeah. I, um, so, you know, like, for example, like Billy Wilder, like I had always loved like Sunset Boulevard and Double Indemnity and like, you know, kind of like the the ones that people are, oh, these are the masterpieces, but I've actually fallen in, like really in love with movies like The Fortune Cookie, and which is, I love that movie so much. Like every time I watch it, like I'm, I'm like, this needs to be talked about more. I'm glad I ended up getting the Twilight Time um, Blu-ray of it before. If it went out of print, I'm pretty sure it may have, may have but I'm glad I got a, like a nice copy of that. Um, I really love like the lost weekend and um, I ended up seeing like on Turner classic movies this past year, I ended up seeing like the front page, which was like a later Walter Matthau, Billy Wilder and Jack Lemmon collaboration. And I love that one as well. Um, you know, and Hitchcock, I actually own every Hitchcock movie that's available. So, and I also, with with Hitchcock, I love all the greats. Rear Window will always be my favorite. It's like top five movie for me. I love it. Um, but I also love the movies of his that aren't really well loved by people. I think Topaz is one of the best Cold War movies I've ever seen. 
Um, definitely not the greatest movie that he's made, but I happen to love that movie a lot. And, um, you know, and so like another one that I love of Hitchcock is probably like, um, I mean, I love, I love Rope a lot. Um, but I remember when Rope, you know, before the internet, Rope was definitely known as the one Hitchcock movie that it was the one take movie. And it was kind of a failure a little bit when it came out. This was before the internet when I realized that everybody loved it um, to a point. And um, yeah, and Martin Scorsese growing up watching Casino um, on USA Network, the edited versions of those movies. I fell in love with everything he did. And I remember people looking at me kind of weird when I was like in elementary school saying, I want to see Taxi Driver. And they're like, oh, I don't think you're, that's a movie for you. And I'm like, no, it is. I really want to see that, that movie. And uh, yeah, I just, I've always been one of those. I love all the masterpieces of directors. Um, but I also love the other ones that you don't really hear people talk about. Like um, Seven Samurai is an incredible movie. Um, one, one of the greatest movies ever made, in my opinion. Um, one of my favorite movies. But then I was equally blown away when I first saw High and Low um, with Tashir Mifuni as well. Like that movie was incredible. I was like, um, man, he could do just as many amazing things in this setting, in this genre, than he can in a samurai film. Like it was just an incredible movie. And so those are some some examples. I could really talk for like five hours just picking and choosing different movies from different directors. Like I love everything that, um, I love everything Stanley Kubrick's done. Um, yeah, there, there was a period of time where you know, I had Kubrick shirts. Like I was one of the, like I would tell you that Stanley Kubrick would be like my favorite director. It kind of just comes and goes um, how I feel about that. And so, yeah, that's kind of, those are some examples. Obviously I could talk forever about more, but. <clears throat> Oh, that's interesting. I, I, let I have to uh, pick up on something that you said about Alfred Hitchcock and Topaz. That's a, a very interesting choice, as you say. Not many people, I think, talk about that one. Uh, but I find that film also to be very fascinating for a number of reasons. Uh, I think primarily, it, it it's a film that feels. I know it comes rather late in his career mm -hmm. and maybe it, it might be seen as being maybe suffering a little bit uh, because it, it maybe it feels like a little bit of the, the Hitchcock touch. It might not be as present or it might not be as felt as say, as it might ex have existed in say his films from the 1950s, for example. Yeah. But uh, even, even so, I, I feel like in many ways, it feels like a, it, it feels almost like an experimental film uh, because, uh, I mean, without going into too many details, it's like uh, each film pretty much uh, up to that point has always had a protagonist and some kind of situation. And of course we've had maybe ways in which that have that has been uh, played around with and there's a, a type of of story presentation you know we we are introduced to our characters and this is the characters that we will essentially follow throughout the throughout the film there have been i think a couple of exceptions or a few very exceptional uh, examples in his film filmography where he's really uh, twisted that particular expectation uh, in terms of suddenly shifting our dynamic and um, and expecting us to follow a completely new character all of a sudden without almost abruptly, and I think the examples that come to mind to me are Psycho and Topaz. And the reason why I say Topaz is because, as you know, because you've seen the film, mm -hmm. the film essentially is like an, a a bunch of vignettes 
exactly. a bunch of short stories. There are kind of main characters that we kind of follow, yes. Yeah. But it goes from their story to the, these person. Who are these? We've never met these people before, and yet we're suddenly involved with it. And this is the very outset. Who are these people that are in this situation? The family, and but mm-hmm. we are involved with them for that particular moment. And then it cuts to a completely different set of characters. And then it cuts to the scene you know, with the hotel and, and, and the, the, the cat, you know, and trying the to get in. Scene exactly. Is one yeah. of my all time favorite Hitchcock sequences. Like it's, I, that's one I'll be like, if people were like, to me, that whole sequence alone is worth the price to pay for that movie to watch it. Like, that's how I feel about that. Like, it's incredible. Like yeah. the, just the way I think it's kind of like another kind of rear window kind of feeling where you're actually like viewing this POV kind of thing, but then it, Oh, it's, I, I, I love it. And I think that's why I love that movie so much because it was so different. I mean, you really go from one character to this and you're like, Oh wait, this is the guy that was in these pictures that they were looking at over here. And meanwhile, yes. he's a main character now. So yeah, that's, yes, that's an excellent point. And it's, and, and then we leave, some of we we meet the characters for the first time and then we go to somewhere some other story and we wonder are we going to go back to this earlier story mm-hmm. or not maybe we do maybe we don't and and we are left and then suddenly we go into a, an a, i think the third act which is a, a which goes into a, like a higher level of espionage right yeah. we you know maybe there's the the ground level espionage and the and the the, the street level as it were and we're down and down into the actual uh, uh, sp- spy craft, and then we go into higher levels of of power and influence, and who might be what what's going on here? Who might be this? What is Topaz, etc.? And yeah. it becomes this huge house of cards, and you go from place to place to place to place. And I think it it sustains that really really well. I mean, I, it it is it's it has its I think issues, yeah. um, but that's for sure. But it, I think it it holds up very well. So I'm gl- so glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. One one thing I think also, because one thing I always hear people say when they're talking negatively about it is they say it's confusing. It confuses them. They can't follow it. And I don't, I could see that. And I think personally, maybe it could be to the hurt of the film. Maybe it's because when you, usually when you see these spy movies, you're like, okay, there's this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. And they're all played by very famous people. So, Whereas Topaz, there's famous actors in it, but like you don't really see a like, I mean John Vernon, great actor, um, John Forsythe was is it John Forsythe that he was in it? Like great actors, but they weren't like headliners. Like it wasn't Jimmy Stewart, it wasn't Cary Grant, and I think maybe people got confused because they were seeing these other people come back into the movie who they recognized, but they didn't have like a famous name to go with the face so they weren't like oh we're back to him maybe it's like wait so this is the guy from the beginning and i think that's maybe that's kind of what hurt the film a little bit i'm of the opinion that maybe if it had really big bankable stars it would have been done better but then i start thinking about torn curtain which is another movie i like that had julie andrews and paul newman and there's still people that don't like that movie as well so maybe my theory is a little off on that but um yeah i just i just love topaz and um i've actually been itching to watch it over the last couple weeks what it reminds me of is like i'm reading like a or watching like i feel like topaz even though it's written by a different author of the book but i feel like that's hitchcock if he was directing like tinker taylor soldier spy or something like that some huge thing with like a bunch of different um you know, things going on and can easily confuse people, which I love. I love getting confused, especially in a spy movie, because I feel like I'm in the world as well. And then at the end, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this world is just deceitful. You know, that kind of thing. But yeah, sorry to go off on that little. Um, but oh, no, not at all. That's no, I'm, <laughs> as I say, I'm really glad you mentioned it. And it's it's uh it, it, it's very interesting. It's it is it is a, a story about spycraft. Um, it um, there are uh, there are some dynamics about that. It, it makes for I think interesting comparison 
with say, as you mentioned, Tinker, Tinker Taylor, Soldier Spy, or uh, uh, Jean Le Carré, or something like that. But mm-hmm. the uh, and uh, does it always hold up in that regard? Again, I think uh, it, it's worth a kind of critical or comparative analysis on that on that on that score. But what I think also is a very strong point of Topaz is it it shows it. There are some very clever techniques in terms of sound and and, and experimental techniques uh, that are still on display. Uh, the camera work is, I think, uh, quite impressive in a lot of areas. The um, uh, what I also like too is it it there is a very sinister and savage edge to it, and in terms of uh, I mean what we see and the way that violence is portrayed on screen yeah. and also what is suggested because a lot of stuff happens of course off screen and we get this information about what happens it becomes almost like a throwaway line about what happens in one story but we actually followed that particular story to a certain degree and so what might seem like a throwaway thing uh, maybe a, n- a non-consequential death or something we feel because it we we've known those characters for a little bit and we see little glimpses of those shots and it's horrifying yeah it's absolutely horrifying the implications of what might happen so so i, I that film topaz i'm so glad you you mentioned it cuz i really think it deserves <laughs> really deserves this uh this as much attention as it as it can yeah, get I mean, yeah in some ways it could be equally as as to me i had the same kind of some of the especially like the hotel scene like those scenes were just as like knuckle, like white knuckle suspense to me as watching something like, um, you know, even something later like Frenzy, you know, that has these intense scenes. But I think in some ways, uh, Topaz has that dark and ugly side too that, um, yeah, I mean, it kind of is kind of like what you said, it's very experimental. Like Hitchcock was playing with a lot of, uh, it'd be interesting what it would have been like if he was younger in his career and he was able to further take some of those ideas but um but then again you look at his filmography and even rope like a long to appear like it was one long take like he was somebody who was always experimenting like kind of ahead of his time in a way i mean rear window is so ahead of its time in terms of um just having a guy like stare out the window and dealing with like in terms of American cinema, like just voyeurism in general and stuff like that. And um, and then you go up to psych. I mean, he was always pushing, pushing, like pushing buttons and like doing things outside the normal. And I think just when it came to Topaz, maybe it's just the world was just different and obviously maybe his age and stuff. But I think he was doing some great things in that movie that I think spy movies, great spy movies these days, maybe wouldn't have if it wasn't for a movie like Topaz. I just think there's some things about it that um, I I think Hitchcock was on to something and I would like to have seen him kind of hone in that craft a little bit more in terms of that style. But, you know, obviously he was a lot older when he did it, but um, he was always on to something, which is why why I like him so much. Yeah, there were always maybe political well not always but there there were hints of that in you're absolutely right uh, but, but there were hints of that in films like say um maybe notorious mm-hmm. or um i mean if we go even further back i mean films like even the the uh, the first uh version of say the man who knew too much or yeah, but uh, in terms of a Cold War spy thriller or political thriller of that sort, it, it, you, you're probably going to get that that one two of uh, Torn Curtain and Topaz. Right? Yeah, that's for sure. And those are very interesting. That's an interesting back to back. I mean, let let's complete the conversation here about uh, you, we spoke about Topaz. What about Torn Curtain? How do you you mentioned that you like that film as well. Yeah, I like it. I don't think I like it nearly as much as Topaz. I think. I like that movie a lot because I like Julie Andrews and Paul Newman. Um, but it's not one I go to all the time. I haven't really looked at it critically. Sometimes it's, it's, it's one of those movies I feel like just when I'm watching it, maybe it could be like 20 minutes or 30 minutes shorter, but it does have what I think is like 
an incredible death scene that that famous scene with um you know how hard it is i think even on the on the dvd title like in the chapter the old dvd title when they had named chapters it, the chapter was how hard it is to kill a man and it was like they were trying to kill this guy and it was like it felt like it lasted 10 minutes but um yeah i mean i like torn curtain i don't love it it would probably be on like one of my lower on the lower end of hitchcock for me considering i love i, I really love all of his films it's probably like a lower tier hitchcock but um I still really like it, but I ended up, I, maybe I just love Topaz so much because my, my, um, like my expectations were so low because I was going in expecting to see the worst Hitchcock movie ever. And then as I was watching it and I was like, man, I think it, there's some weird stuff that maybe kind of can, like, it's not the best. There is some flaws, but like the hotel scene and then, um, and maybe me living in Florida too and growing up knowing about like how scary the Cuban Missile Crisis situation was and how that tied into the story. Um, I just, I just loved it. But yeah, I, I definitely really like Torn Curtain. I think it's probably the Hitchcock movie along with Family Plot that I've seen the least, which I like them all. I just, they're not like my absolute favorites. Oh, thank you very much for that. Yes, yes, um, yes. The, uh, the the scene in the farmhouse. Yeah, it's probably yes. It's uh, but and there are a, a number of uh, other uh, uh, moments. It was. I always felt it. It was a nice. It it felt like a nice maybe counterpoint film to something like say suspicion the film that yeah. he did called suspicion with Joan Fontaine and Cary Grant, because there is that element uh, of who is this person uh, from Julie Andrews perspective and point of view, right. who is the Paul Newman character and what, what, who is he really? And what, what is, what are his motivations? And we, and we are left wondering and questioning what they are because there is a mystery. And I think that that is a kind of nice echo, if you will, or, or nice counterpoint to a, a similar type of situation that we see with, uh, with character or, or relationship dynamics and in suspicion and other films, of course, but yeah, that's, that's a, that's really uh, interesting. Uh, and so the, the, I, I mean, you mentioned so many filmmakers here, and Scorsese as well and watching Casino and I was there too I watched the Casino it wasn't the edited version but it was the the VHS the two tape VHS yeah and the same for Seven Samurai too is the two tape VHS and the um uh and but in that list uh, uh you, you know there there were uh earlier in the conversation you mentioned uh say sci-fi and horror so I'd like to now return uh, to that part of your cinema journey and now just say, what are some of your favorite horror films and for filmmakers? Uh, and you said that was a genre that you love and love. So, yeah, I am. Um, that's one, even though I've like have a lifelong love of horror movies and I, I, you know, love John Carpenter movies. I like Wes Craven movies. Um, Recently, I like maybe about two years ago, I watched like six or seven different Argento movies and loved them as well. Um, I really want to go get further into like Asian horror and more into like Italian horror and like different something other than American horror. But I grew up loving the Universal Monsters. I used to watch those on VHS as a kid. And um I mean, my horror collection is so like all over the place and to where like I remember I was going through a phase where I just wanted to see how much, how many controversial movies I can get. And one of the movies I bought when it first came on DVD was like Cannibal Holocaust and um, hard movie to watch, but I think it is in some ways a great movie. And I actually did a video on my YouTube channel like years back about it and people were like, um that's interesting you would say that's a great movie and i was like 
and my whole point was the fact that it shows the difference between like what we would say a civilization and uh you know an uncivil civilization based on like living the city life and stuff and is are human beings better now that we're civilized or not because these people did some bad stuff to the people that really didn't you know, they just lived out in the middle of nowhere and they had their own way of life. And so like, I thought those questions that it asked and then being a lover of horror movies and obviously some fun gore type stuff, I was caught off guard about how serious the topic was that the movie kind of threw at you um, to where it um, disturbs you. And I think that's where the horror element came in. I mean, because I was incredibly disturbed by that. And I... um, to this day think like mankind just needs to stop going to these tribes and like ruining and doing all this. I mean, that's just kind of where my mind went with that movie. And I think it's great based on the questions that it asks, whether it was intentional or not, but that's how I view the movie. And I think it's interesting how it has that tie in with, um, you know, the footage that's the, they're trying to decide whether they're going to show the footage or not. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm thinking, this shouldn't even be an issue. Like you shouldn't like, to me, it talks just as much about society and news as a whole that like network does like, you know, I love network and it kind of answers, asks some of those same questions in a very different way, but just makes you think about how mankind is and how the media is in terms of exploiting people. So yeah, that's, I don't know how I got on that topic, but yeah, I love all horror movies pretty much. Um, but I really want to get into more. That's I've told myself this year is the year I want to get more into. Um, Cause with horror, I've always been kind of the same watching, you know, all the Halloweens, all the Friday 13th Ramiro movies and um, random ones here and there. Um but I definitely want to get further, further into it. I mean, I've seen countless horror movies and I love, love most of the ones that I've seen, but um, I definitely have some room to grow. Sometimes I hear, or I see people that I follow on Instagram posting about all these movies. I'm like, gosh, I've never even heard of that. Um, That's even though it's the genre that I could say, maybe I loved first in movies. It's the one I've neglected probably the most because I've, I left that to go explore everything else. So I feel like now as an adult, um, you know, in my thirties, like now I'm like, okay, now I need to go back to where I started and kind of realize all those genres, sub genres within horror movies as well. So, uh, what, so in the, uh, in the, say the films that you, you uh, know or grew up on, or uh, like you mentioned, I think Friday the 13th and, Nightmare on Elm Street and Halloween. So let's let's take those for example. Uh, so let's let's say uh, Halloween. So what are what are some of your favorites in the Halloween series, as it were? Um, Halloween one and two will always be like my favorite Halloween movies. As a kid, okay. seeing them on TV and then marathoning them back to back on Halloween night, which was a tradition I kept probably every year since I was from like nine until maybe like two or three years ago because of the way like Halloween always started falling on like the nights that I had to work the next day. And obviously I'm not going to stay up when I have to get up at four 30 in the morning. So like I kind of broke that tradition, but I still watch them. Um, Halloween one and two. I wasn't always crazy about the later Halloween films. Um, I like them, um, but the first two were always my favorite. I would say, even though Halloween is probably like one of my all time, it's a top 10 favorite movie for me, but as a whole, a series, Friday the 13th is probably my favorite horror franchise because, um, I mean, I like every one of those films, like for different ways. Like I could just, those are movies like, like if I get my, um, which I enjoyed the videos that you did with the um, Shout Factory set. I could get that Shout Factory set off my shelf and start watching the movies now and have fun for the next two days watching all those movies. And uh, 
that's kind of what I did as a kid. I used to rent the Friday 13th movies all the time and just marathon them and rent them. But it's funny because Halloween um, was the better movie to me, but I think Friday 13th had better, better sequels. That was, as a kid, that's how I was. And that's kind of, I still prefer all the sequels to Friday 13th over, um, oops, fell again, um, like Halloween 4 and 5. I love Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, which I think it's a, I love that film so much. Um, thankfully I didn't see it back when I was younger when it was oh this one doesn't have Michael Myers in it it's terrible so like I saw it older and I watched it and I was like this is like an incredible Twilight Zone episode that was like even though it wasn't directed by him but it had because of the score it had the feeling of John Carpenter and I loved it and to this day I love Halloween 3 yeah. And I kind of wish in some ways that they continued making anthology horror film or Halloween films, but um, obviously that's like in hindsight, yeah. but I, I love that film. Um, yeah, me too. I, I think that's a great, I saw that when I was a kid and it was, it was one of the most traumatizing experiences. I've had a number of traumatizing experience watching films as a kid and that was one of them that yeah. that film and i think you're you're absolutely right because it didn't have it it, it was different right for obvious reasons mm-hmm. than say halloween and halloween 2 that came before it but that was probably now that i think about it that was probably a in in from a certain point of view a kind of stroke of genius because it meant that when you watch the film you're totally off guard you're you're thinking oh this is this what's going on this you're you're totally upended and you're left out of balance and then there's a point where you think oh this is this doesn't have a particular character so okay i'm not going to take it seriously in that regard and then boom it yep. it hits you with these these incredibly scary <laughs> moments that come out of nowhere and uh, this eight more days yeah. till halloween yeah halloween. yeah exactly like, Whoa. yeah and the song and the, and the and how it just it it's um it's like um what is it like it's what's why well, i forget the it's like uh, christopher nolan's inception an idea is planted mm-hmm. in your mind you can't ever unthink it ever again so it's it's yeah. that, that, that probably the best example of, of cinema inception is is that theme song the silver shamrock song from halloween yeah. season if, if you listen to it once you'll never be able to forget it ever and so uh, and that's, I think, a power, of, a, uh, an example of the power of that film, that's for sure. But oh, so and then you mentioned Friday the 13th. So I have to ask, so what are some of your favorites from that? So uh, uh, Friday the 13th uh, films. Um, Friday thir- the first Friday the 13th movie I ever saw was three. And then um, I ended up seeing uh, two or I ended up seeing four five, six. I ended up seeing all of them over the years but three was like the first big one that i saw and in fact i remember um seeing going back to the original i was like okay now i'm gonna see for finally i'm gonna see the first one with jason and then i remember watching it and i'm going wait a second wait a second this isn't so i remember that twist was like even greater for me because going into it i was like oh it's definitely jason it's definitely jason and i was like whoa i was like Betsy Palmer. Oh my gosh. Like, um, and so I, I, I love those movies and I have so much fun with them. One thing I forgot to mention when we were talking about other horror movies is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies. Those are, um, those were huge movies to me. Um, as a kid, I remember, um, I saw the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre and was completely an utterly disturbed by it but then enthralled by it at the same time because i was like this is just something i have never seen before it's like unlike anything i've ever seen so much so that i pretty much um i was big into making like little short films as a kid and as a kid i actually did a at the time i was like a shot for shot remake but i actually did my own little movie called the florida saw massacre and it starred my brother my nephew and my brother-in-law at the time, um, that's actually, I'll have to send you the link to that. It's actually on, I uploaded it on my YouTube channel like six years ago. 
and I basically do a shot for shot, not shot for shot, but it's about a, a five minute remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre with um, instead of being like a group going past a house, you know, because they're heading to a um, they're heading to check out a cemetery or something. It just, just starts out with my brother and my nephew get a flat tire in the car and they got to go into the house to ask the owner if they have uh, if they have any spare tires that they could use and they just stumble upon uh, a saw swinging um, hockey mask wearing murderer <laughs> and uh, I remember using cough syrup and ketchup as like blood and it was it, it was incredible I, I like doing those kind of things from time to time and I remember having like a little premiere with my family and uh yeah so texas chainsaw massacre was one i loved so much to where i ended up trying to remake it as a 13 year old i was actually 12 or 13 when that happened yeah i'll have to send you the link it's pretty hilarious in hindsight oh yes please i i look forward to that yeah i'm i'm also a big big fan and admirer of that film uh i think it's it's uh it, it, it's it's one of those where it it really goes for the the absolute sort of fundamentals of what it is that m- makes me scared and there's one thing about it which is how you can have it, like it's not like it, it, right i don't want to go into too many details but what's so what's so remarkably horrifying about it to me is the way that the 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 horrible the horrible stuff there are kind of hints and feelings and yeah. senses of unease that we get along the way but when when it hits it's not like in a a darkened corridor or a mm-hmm. haunted house or something it's it there there is a house of course but it just you're just there and it's a beautiful day and boom oh something ha- and oh my gosh something and then that's it which is yeah, and then it, suddenly everything has changed, mm-hmm. and now of course we have the uh, the just maybe sort of the the marketing type of hindsight of n- knowing generally what the what the look of of these characters is, and and when when we see we we can expect this kind of character to appear, and that's that's the 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 sort of the main antagonist that we will essentially follow more or less throughout the series of films that follows, but. But but in a moment in the film, when you just are into the moment, oh, I, like I've been there. It's just an, it's in terms of oh, it just enjoying a nice day out, just sitting outside in the yard, and something suddenly happens, and then your yeah. whole life is changed forever in this horrible way. Yes, that yeah. is yeah. I mean, I also think that what what kind even to this day, I think. Um, I mean, even like watching a movie like Cannibal Holocaust or something like that, a movie that has so much violence, I have never returned, seen another movie where I felt the same way. Like, the crazy thing is Texas Chainsaw Massacre does not have a lot of blood. There's not a lot of blood in that movie. It's set, like, pure atmosphere and pure setup and the eeriness, like, that's what it's crazy how in my brain, like I think about all those things, how it makes me feel to me, that makes it an incredibly violent movie. But when you look at it, you're like, there's not really a lot of blood, but the experience that you have watching it and like the eeriness and the atmosphere the movie puts off, it's, it just like, it gives you that dirty feeling, but you're like, man, I was just, that movie was incredibly violent, but there was no blood. Um, And it was just based on, how I, as a viewer, and how the low budget nature of the film, and just kind of how it was told, um, it's just it's just incredible. And like you said, like literally, you could just be walking around, and all of a sudden, everything changes. Broad di- broad daylight. I mean, whereas we think of horror movies with people sneaking up around a corner, um, you know, it's kind of like a an, another movie that came out recently that I kind of put it up there with is like midsummer like i that movie that's an incredible movie to me and it's horrifying and it's all under the bright sun of day like it's not a horror movie to where you're like seeing these little shadows and 
that's what um, I wasn't really expecting that about Texas Chainsaw Massacre when I was watching it. I was like, man, there's a lot of dates. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of night stuff, um, but for most of the movie takes place in bright sunlight. <laughs> I don't know if, whether that's more horrifying or not. Uh, that's great. No, thank you so much for that. Yeah, and and for bringing up uh, those films. Those are those are uh, uh, wonderful. And the uh, before I move on, I should say also that you mentioned, for example, Argento, and you mentioned that you 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 were I think beginning to watch Argento or, or watching some of his. What are some of the films that you've seen so far by our so, uh, our Dario Argento? Um, I um. And I own like I own a few of them. Like Suspiria, Suspiria was actually the second one I watched. The first one I watched was um, what it, oh, I have it right over there, and I forgot the off the top of my head. I forgot the name of it. Um, Do you remember what it was the about? One, the the one with Jennifer Connelly and Donald Pleasance. Oh, Phenomena. Um, yeah, Phenomena. Yeah. And I remember I was blown away by that. Like just the 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 music and the yeah. the colors and. And then I ended up seeing um, Suspiria, and I really liked that too. But that was that was actually the last Argento movie I watched. Um, I watched Opera, I, and I I thought that movie was amazing. I loved that movie. And then I saw um, I think is it called Deep Red. I think it's Deep Red. Yeah, I saw that one. But Opera was probably like the one that I never really heard a lot of people talk about. That was the one that I love the most. Um, but um, I already, I already, I already, Phenomena is probably right now, based on what I've seen is my favorite Argento film. Um, I love it. I think the music, the way he did with music and the way he filmed was just incredible. Like, I just love that whole thing. And I, I want to get more into those um, filmmakers and I guess you could say it's like the artsy side of horror movies when you're, used to growing up with you know the horror movies of like the united states and stuff oh yeah argento is a is his films were were so they're so memorable <laughs> let me put yeah. it that way i still remember you spoke about opera i remember when i first saw it was an opera but i first heard about opera in maybe fangoria magazine or something mm -hmm. And I was, oh my goodness, this this looks this looks amazing. And just waiting for the day that I could see opera. And then one day some videotape I rented at the end or something, it had a tra it had a bunch of trailers. And one of the trailers was it was called Terror at the Opera. And I was just my wow, oh, my I was watching that over and over again. I was better like whatever film it was, I forget the film, the VHS, but it was that trailer. And it was so exciting, and I saw it, and it was, yeah, that that is something else. Uh, the the camera work, the this the audacity of the camera work. Just thinking, like, oh, you know, I'm I I want to shoot this scene. I want to have the camera here, and people are like, what, what? Are you really, you you're saying you want the camera right right inside? Yes, I want it here, or I want the <laughs> the the perspective of the birds. What what you want? Oh yes, I want to actually show them. Oh my goodness, just the 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 audacity and the genius of, of the choices that are in that film and uh oh you know i i don't want to go into but oh oh how are we going to solve this mystery oh let's ask the birds oh yeah brilliant yes and just yeah. uh, it's it's great oh and that's that's even not even beginning to scratch the surface of just the mm -hmm. genius levels that are existing in that film and horrifying and yeah and so so over the top in terms of its violence as well oh my goodness yes what a great yeah, choice that, that, that was like a that was a, a definite late night movie for me i i definitely was that was one that i was like i'm gonna put this on and maybe until i fall asleep and then i'll just go and i ended up I ended up staying awake later because so I was like, oh my gosh, I need to see more of these. <laughs> so oh that's 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 wonderful. I hope you keep on enjoying your Argento journey. I think there there are a lot of uh, there are a lot there that are I that yeah. are awaiting. And so I, I think you will enjoy them uh, very much. But uh, oh this is really wonderful, Ryan. And so I 
I I I I want to uh, uh, thank you so much for this time that you've given and this conversation, and you've uh, been very generous in sharing with us uh, things about your cinema journey and your life and where you are now and your perspective. And so I want to thank you so much for this, Ryan. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Oh, I, I definitely, I definitely enjoyed this. This was, this was a lot of fun. I, uh, um, who knows, maybe like six months from now, we could do this kind of thing again. I just liked finally getting to talk to you. It's been awesome actually having a good conversation, you know, face to face. Cause I mean, this is the first time we've actually, well, face to face, um, yeah. we've actually talked live in person. That's right. Yes. Yes. Uh, we've spoken a number of occasions, of course, before, but never like this. So this is really, mm-hmm. this is a lot of fun. So yes, let's do this again. I'd love to be able to to continue this. And uh, uh, yeah, let let us do that if it's okay. Oh yeah, I'm I'm always game for that. I mean, oh, I one of my favorite things about the community and being on YouTube is um, if it was, if it was up to me every time I filmed a video, I would have somebody with me discussing stuff. Like to me, these are the, my favorite types of video to watch. I mean, um, it's just like when you see a bunch of filmmakers like getting together and talking or an actors that you like, I mean, not everybody in our lives have the same kind of taste and interest in whatever it is, whether it's sports or movies, but us in this film community, we all have a like interest and it's so great when we come together, like just me and you talking just now, like, brought up some great memories of walking into blockbuster and stuff like that. And I like, that's one of my favorite parts about um, being in this community. So I greatly thank you for inviting me on and um, great time. Great time. Oh, thank you very much, Ryan. you that's uh, your, your sentiments are very much appreciated and shared by me. And uh, I know by many others. So Thank you. And before we go, though, Ryan, uh, may I ask, are there any maybe recommendations uh, that you might be willing to share with us as uh, before you leave? Are, are there any films that you think uh, we should uh, pay attention to or any releases or things of that nature? Um, one movie that I um, was thinking about because I've actually kind of slightly rededicated my channel this year to movies that I don't really hear a lot of people talk about anymore. And a lot of that is, is um, I've been buying a ton of Warner archive titles and I've been really, um, I want to do like a huge thirties or even a code series on my channel eventually this year. Um, but in that journey of buying a bunch of Warner archive movies, I posted about it on social media, a bunch um this is one movie I definitely wanted to show and it is, uh, and I, I think you, you, you are aware that I was sharing this on social media, but it was, um, Scarecrow from 1973 or was it 73? Um, this is a movie I never heard anybody talk about. And I was like Gene Hackman and Al Pacino in a movie together. That's incredible. And, um, actually features, in my opinion, some of the greatest things about Al Pacino as an actor. Um, uh, I don't think I've felt um, the emotions I felt from watching this movie from any other movie, even though I love every Al Pacino movie pretty much. Um, I even own Jack and Jill, and I will proclaim that from the rooftops. I think that movie's hilarious, and Al Pacino making fun of himself is hilarious. That comment alone might get people to comment on the video saying, how dare he like that movie? And <laughs> But uh, this movie was incredible and it blew me away when I saw it. And I don't really hear a lot of people talk about it. So I just wanted to kind of just show it and be like, if you're watching this stream and you've never seen this movie, see it. It's a cross country trip with two great actors um, just trying to make it in. And it has a really good feel of like the, slight optimis- optimis- um, optimism and cynicism of 1970s cinema. And I think it's a great balance. And uh, yeah, I highly recommend everybody to see this movie if you haven't. 
So that's one of the main ones I've been wanting to recommend to everybody. Whew. I don't think I breathed. <laughs> I don't think I breathed the entire time I just said all that. <laughs> well, again, it's a, you're you're showing the the your your passion for cinema and the 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 stamina and, and physical fortitude much like your 24-hour movie marathon yeah. discussion right so that's wonderful well and done really, Mike, thank you and really quick here's a couple yeah, more please, please. I'm, a, I'm a fugitive from a chain gang paul muni one of the greatest um 30s films i've ever seen check it out everybody and then went through an edward g robinson phase like hardcore last year saw pretty much everything that he's in this is john ford the whole town's talking. And this is the movie that he plays two people, and he's actually in in the scenes with himself playing a lookalike. They're like almost like twins, but they're not. A gangster and just a newspaper man, and they're talking about how he looks exactly like the gangster, and is this the gangster? And it's another incredible film by John Ford. Check it out, everybody. Please do yourself a favor. There we go. Those are some Ryan recommends for you. Oh, Ryan, thank you so much. Really, thank you very much for that. <laughs> and uh, once again, thank you for your time. And uh, we will have, there will be uh, links to the uh, your YouTube channel in the description box below. So for anyone who is, as I say, meeting you for the first time and is interested, uh, you can check out Ryan's channel, YouTube channel. It's it's a lot of fun. So Ryan Chataway, my dear friend, thank you so much. And we'll talk again very soon. All right. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Cheers.